please put your hands together, give a warm welcome, round of applause for Dr. Jessica Gallagher. <laughs> Now, it's a bit chilly in here with the air conditioning, so I'd like to get everyone moving for a moment. So I just want you to relax your arms out for me and just shake them to the side. We had a bit of Taylor Swift before shaking it off for me. That's it. Now, what I want you to do is bring your hands together into two fists for me. Bring them together in front of your nose and pop them right on top of that bridge of your nose. And I want you to leave them here for a moment and take a look around the room. I want you to think about three things. What can you see as you're looking around the room? What can't you see? And most importantly, how are you trying to see? How are you moving your head or your body and trying to get around the fact that you can't see straight ahead of you? Now, when you're ready, you're welcome to bring those fists down. <laughs> nice and sync, I like it. This was the reality that I was faced with when at the age of 17, I received the news that would change my life forever. And I remember it vividly. I was in year 12. I was an elite junior netballer and basketballer. I wanted to be an osteopath or a lawyer. I had my whole life ahead of me. And all of a sudden, I remember coming home from school, running to my room, slamming the door shut, closing the curtains and throwing myself under my doona because I was in so much pain. I was suffering severe migraines and I couldn't keep my eyes open because they were so sore. I didn't know what was causing it or why. All I knew was that I wanted it to stop and I wanted the world to disappear away underneath with me in that doona. Very soon after, I found myself at the hospital, my mum sitting next to me, the eye specialist sitting opposite, about to deliver the news that would change my life forever. Jess, I'm really sorry. We've found that you've lost over 90% of your eyesight. You have a rare, incurable, <coughs> degenerative eye disease. Your eyesight will get worse, but we don't know when or by how much. And so as I was sitting here in this chair and trying to comprehend what had just been said to me, I, my mum stood up and walked straight past me. As soon as her foot stepped outside that door, she burst into tears. Naturally, the specialist followed after her, but in her haste hadn't been able to shut the door, so I could hear the entire conversation. And I distinctly remember one sentence. Is this my fault? The other piece of information we'd just been told was that it was genetic. And so my mum had thought that she had brought this upon her little girl. And how was she going to live her life when she was losing her eyesight? And so as, as I was sitting there in this chair listening to this conversation and listening to my mum crying, I, my, heart, my head was running at a million miles an hour. And I decided at that moment that I needed to make some choices. My first choice was to have courage, was to know that my life would never be the same, that there were things that I was never going to be able to do, like drive a car, but that no matter what happened, if I remained courageous, I could beat anything. Secondly, I chose to create opportunities for myself. I knew people were going to put barriers up they were going to stereotype me as a person with a disability. But if any door closed, I would always find another way, even if it meant creating a brand new door. Thirdly, I decided to have no regrets. I didn't want to be that young girl sitting in the room all by myself listening to my mum crying outside. I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. And in knowing that I was going to lose more of my eyesight, I didn't want to look back in five, ten years' time and wish that I had done something, but was too scared because of my eyesight. So, I decided to become an osteopath. But firstly, I want to talk about what I can see. It's the question that I'm most commonly asked. And uh, because I look able-bodied, how many of you thought walking in here today that I was someone who was classified as legally blind? Not many, probably. Up here we have on the left a person, a nice, handsome, smiling man looking back at you. And this is what you would see if you had 20-20 vision. Me, on the other hand, I see what's on the right. Basically a complete blur. My disease affects my central vision, which means that if somebody is walking towards me, I see their outline, 
because I do have some peripheral vision. But I completely miss fine detail and colour contrast. So as somebody walks toward me, I see that outline, but I don't see what's on the inside. I miss facial expressions, colour contrasts, what people are wearing. It's a little wonder then that the first comment I always receive when I meet someone is, so I uh, guess you don't really realise how good looking I actually am. <laughs> I had a dollar for every time somebody said that to me. Oh, you'd think they'd come up with something original. And so I moved on. I uh, became an osteopath, the career where I get to use my hands to do the work. For all you sports nuts out there, I'm the osteopath for A-League side Melbourne City FC in Melbourne, obviously. At the age of 19, I decided to take a trip overseas on a working holiday. I'd been forced to give up playing elite junior level net netball and basketball because... Well, ball sports and vision loss don't really go hand in hand with one another. And so I jumped at the opportunity to try something new. So I went overseas to Vail in Colorado and learnt to snowboard. And it was an amazing learning experience. I was still coming to terms with the fact that how do you tell someone that you have low vision when you meet them for the first time? How do you tell them when you are walking towards them that you can't see them? I remember dating a boy for three months and uh, it took me three months before halfway down the hill one day I stopped and told him I had something really, really important and um, like I, I have low vision and um, yeah, I can't see very well. And his response was, yeah, I know. And as I stood there in confusion, he goes, well, you have your computer up here when you use it. I figured there was something wrong with your eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think I can hide it, but really it's pretty obvious at times. When I came back, I discovered the world of Paralympic sport and all of a sudden that fire reignited inside of me, that desire to be the best at what I do. Very quickly, they discovered that I was an athletic individual with a sporting history. In 2008, I found myself qualifying for four events at the Beijing Paralympic Games. I went over to Beijing and the day before the opening ceremony, I had some eye tests done. One of the unique elements of Paralympic sport is that you need to be classified to ensure you're on a level playing field. I had these tests done and they found that one of my eyes was eligible, but the other eye was 0.01 of a percent two-sighted. And so I was banned from competing. <laughs> really, it was a very ironic situation. And in an ironic twist of fate, in the specialist trying to console me because I was devastated that I wasn't going to be able to compete for my country, he told me that my eyesight was going to get worse in six months. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Still not sure how I was supposed to react to that. It was a very bizarre time. But prior to Beijing, they discovered that I could snowboard. And so the very first question was, would she be eligible for Vancouver? And so in the hope that I was going to lose more of my eyesight, <laughs> I started training for Winter Paralympic sport. Luckily, it did deteriorate. And uh, in 2010, after 150 days on skis, I became Australia's first female Paralympic winter medalist on my 24th birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, eight months later, I was back at the World Athletics Championships picking up a silver and bronze in the long jump and javelin. Finished fifth and sixth in the same events in London in 2012. Unfortunately, had a, a serious knee injury. And then last year in Russia, uh, earned myself a, another bronze medal, this time in the giant slalom. But I want to take you into this world of mine, the unique world of elite vision impaired sport. As a ski racer, I skied 100 kilometres an hour and it's an incredibly complex and unique challenge. My adaptive equipment is a human being. I ski with a guide, his name is Eric, and he skis five to 10 metres in front of me. Inside our helmets, we have high tech headsets and a little microphone in front of our mouths so that we can communicate as we're going down the slopes. When I ski, I can't see the ground, I can't see pitch changes, I can't see snow condition changes, I can't see the gates that I'm supposed to be skiing around. And my eyesight dramatically changes depending on what's in the background, whether there are trees, there's a town, there's safety fencing, or worst of all, a complete washout. Then there's one final little element, speed. A lot can go wrong in a very, very short period of time. So, this is what we look like. Eric and I snake down the hill in sync with one another. Our relationship is such that I, my conscious doesn't think. As soon as an instruction is put through that headset from Eric, my subconscious automatically reacts, instructing my body 
to make the movements required. This is the exact run that I skied last year in Russia. And this is what you would see if you were fully sighted and had a guide in front of you. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> and this, this is what I see. So I, it's pretty steep, and I want you to think back to that first question I asked at the start. How are you trying to see? When I am skiing, it's never about the 93% of eyesight that I've lost. It's always about that amazing 7% that I still have. When I'm skiing, I search for that eyesight because I know I'm going to get scared as soon as I lose vision of my guide. Incredibly important element, in particular, when you're adding speed. So, you're thinking, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Maybe, a little bit silly. But there are three elements to my life that enable me to do this. And so they give me the self-belief and the empowerment to throw myself down a mountain, regardless of the situation. So let me show you. Oh, uh, the whiteboard. No, it's all right. I saw it. I know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. I knew where it is. All right. Vision impaired girl using the whiteboard. Here we go. OK. The first element is trust. Seems pretty obvious, right, after watching that footage? Trust is often defined as the glue of life. It's the most essential ingredient in effective communication, and it's the foundation of all relationships. There is no greater skill set that I require with Eric than trust. The most unique element of that relationship is the fact that I, as the athlete, take control over Eric and I as a team as we're going down those slopes. But what's even harder is the fact that I need to surrender complete control to Eric because at the end of the day, his job is to get me down in one piece. And so I'd like you to think about this right now for me. If you had to hand over what you're doing right now in your life or your job, could you give it over completely, knowing that you had any, no impact on whether or not you succeeded or failed and there was nothing you could do about it? It's essentially the world that I'm in. At the 2010 Vancouver Winter Paralympics, when Eric and I became Australia's first female Winter Paralympic medalists, naturally, <laughs> as Australia's first female Winter Paralympic medalist, it's the top of Eric's resume, also, as I like to call him, Erica, <laughs> affectionately known as. But we discovered, for the first time, that complete loss of control, both as individuals and as a team. It was the first time that I had ever skied in rain and we discovered that rain completely obliterates my eyesight, rendering me completely blind. And I was petrified. And so as we were going up the chairlift, preparing for our second run, and Eric calmly says to me, I've got no idea what you're complaining about. You can't see anyway. What difference does a few rain droplets make? And uh, as I was you know, sitting there going, uh, a few choice words being edited out of my head at this stage. And so I replied, well, Eric, you know, when you have 100% vision and you lose 10%, you still have 90. But when you have 7% and you lose 10%, well, it's a little bit different. And so as we were going to the start of the course, we pushed to the start gate. Now, Eric and I strategize any time we're at the top of the mountain. As soon as I push into that start gate, I listen for four simple words. Jess, R, you ready. And at that moment, I do a brain swipe. What does that mean? It means that at that very moment, I know that I need to surrender complete control and hand over that trust and let Eric get me down the mountain safely. And so I listened for these four simple words and then the start ref give me three, two, one, go. I pushed out of the start gate. Rain obliterated my eyesight, but it was okay. I was prepared. I knew it was coming, even though I was scared. What I wasn't prepared for was the silence. All of a sudden, I realised it was really, really quiet. And then I realised the rain had malfunctioned our headsets. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I screamed, Eric! Our headsets are malfunctioning. And Faintly down the hill, I obviously couldn't see or hear at this stage. Faintly, I very heard, come on, Jess. 
let's do this, left, come on, left, giving me instructions as we're going down the slope. And at that moment, I realised there was only one thing that I could do. It didn't matter how scared I was. I had to bring together every ounce of strength, physical and mental, and just let go and trust that he would get me down safely, which he did. Trust, it's all about teamwork, communication and collaboration. The second element is mindset. The agile mind is about maintaining complete openness to your peripheral vision whilst maintaining intense focus on your tunnel vision. Most people find it amusing, entertaining when I tell them that I ride a bike by myself. But I like to see things a little bit differently. When I'm on my bike, there are a hundred things running through my head in any given moment. By, by utilising change management, I'm able to stay in the present and make those moment by moment decisions towards that tunnel vision to focus. So every single thing I'm thinking about, what time of day is it? How many cars will be on the road? What is the light conditions? What will I be able to see? Will I be able to see the traffic lights as I come towards them on the road? If I can't, how am I going to cross the road safely? Are there cars around? Are there pedestrians that I need to look out for? And are there, if there are people I am riding with, can I trust them that if they give me information and I need to react in a split second, that I can do that safely? By maintaining that change management and that motivational strategy, I'm able to maintain all these decisions to focus on that long-term goal. Finally, performance. Never been any good at maintaining, keeping words in lines, given I can't do fine detail very well. Performance foresight is all about looking beyond the now. It's about seeing life four, five, six steps ahead. In my world, I like to call it my blind bubble. It's a five metre radius and it's the world that I see. Inside that bubble, I stay focused on what I can do. I see things clearly. Outside of my bubble, I'm not able to gather information like someone who with full sight would be able to. That means I need to look beyond I need to create information. I need to put stories together in my head so that I can get the information that I need. It's one of the few elements, it was one of the most key elements that has enabled me to be one of a handful of people in the world who represent concurrently their country at a Summer and Winter Paralympic Games. Performance foresight allows me to strategize. It allows me to sacrifice short-term goals for long-term gain and when you have a Paralympic Games every two years. That's an incredibly important skill set to have. So you're probably wondering one final thing, and it's the question that I most commonly ask. Do you get scared? <laughs> the answer is pretty simple, yes. But I came to realise a long time ago, it wasn't my vision that I lost, it was my fear. And trust empowered me to do that. So any time I step into that start gate and hear those four simple words from Eric, Jess, are you ready? A sly little smile comes over my face as I reply, let's go. Thank you.